But uh, tell me, who are some speakers that you think are really good speakers? People that you've heard in the past, or maybe historically you think, now that person, they're a really good speaker. Stephen Anybody? Furtick. Who? Stephen Furtick. Okay. All right. Nobody knows who he is. He's the pastor of Elevation, right? Okay. Anybody else? Tony Campolo. Tony Campolo. Yeah, he's a funny guy. Okay. Anybody else? Francis Chan. Who? Francis Chan. Francis Chan. Okay. Very compelling speaker. Anybody else? Bill Clinton. Oh, Bill. Bill Clinton. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. No. no he demanded an audience, didn't he? Okay. You know, I, I looked on the internet this last uh, this last week. You got one more? Billy Graham. Billy Graham. Okay. Yeah. He's had a quite a he quite a hearing. All right. Um, I went on the internet. You can do you know your own research or whatever. But it, it was interesting. Uh, just to plug in, who are the greatest speakers of all time? Okay, kind of including the historical past and all that kind of stuff. And I thought, okay, well, the first guy that comes up, and he comes up quite often. Gonna give me control here. There we go. Nobody wants to give me control. All right, okay. <laughs> Demosthenes. Demosthenes. Anybody heard of Demosthenes before? Uh, Demosthenes was one of the early, probably the most famous uh, Greek orator of the time. Uh, in Greek uh, idea, basically, if you were a speaker and you were a good orator, you were it. Okay? And these were the rock stars of the Greek era, were the guys that could really speak. And he was well-known, and a lot, of the, a lot of the Greek thought and stuff come, came out of uh, his idea of how to make presentations and such. Now, if you fast forward to the modern era, uh, one of the first guys that comes up on almost all of the websites is this guy. Abraham Lincoln. You know, um, people will debate about what his voice really sounded like. You'd think tall, big man. He probably had this baritone voice. Not so. Historians say that he had a fairly high-pitched voice. And I think you know, maybe he had a voice like mine. Who knows? You know, but, uh, uh, you know, but what the historians would say is like, you know, you would get past his voice in just minutes because his presence. He wouldn't move around a lot. He would, they said you could put a dime between his feet and at the end of his speech it would still be there and he wouldn't have moved. All right? He wasn't a very animated speaker, but what he said was powerful. The Gettysburg Address, probably one of his most famous speeches, only three minutes long. Okay? But powerful. Powerful. Another one who uh, people would agree on is Winston Churchill. During the 1940s, during the World War, especially World War II, he was the voice of, of free Europe. And uh, his speeches around the 1940s uh, and at the outset of World War II, they really cemented his reputation as an amazing orator. Um, he was a trained orator, by the way, too. Now, other people that were on the list aren't necessarily trained orators. Uh, they aren't trained in, in speech. But they were a person of the moment that spoke into something in history that was important at the time. And because of that, they were heard. Uh, Gandhi was one of those people. He gave a famous speech called the Quit India Speech. Um, it was given in uh, 1942, and it called for a determined but passive resistance against England, con England's continued occupation of India. And, uh, and he was heard. Uh, John F. Kennedy was another person that a lot of people would say was a great orator. Uh, he gave a lot of famous speeches. Probably his most famous speech uh, was the one that was given uh, during the Cold War in front of the Berlin Wall. Okay, uh, I'm a Berliner, it was called. And uh, um, the West Berliners, uh, they, they feared this imminent East German occupation. And he spoke into the moment, and it was, it was heard around the world. Now, another person, um, during apartheid, Nelson Mandela came to the forefront. During his trial, he gave a defiant speech before he was put into jail about equality and justice. And it's still a reminder today that I think every school should study. Uh, probably the, the, the most um, reference American speech, of course, comes from this man, right? Martin Luther King Jr., his I Have a Dream speech is huge. Probably the one that's quoted most often in American history. And then uh, probably our most recent American president that was called the great communicator was who? Ronald Reagan. Okay? Now, Ronald Reagan was an actor that was a trained speaker and really took advantage of the, the television camera. He knew how to work an audience, but he was called the great communicator. And during a time in American history, when he spoke into history, and I don't know if you remember his speech, but when he said, 
Mr. Gorbachev, take down this wall. It was huge. And so, you know, there are others, lots of others that I might be missing, you know, that you mentioned quite a few. One of them that, that uh, was not politically correct to have on the list, but should be on the list is Hitler. Okay? Uh, he spoke into people's lives, the German people's lives, and he made them feel special. He spoke the words that they wanted to hear, and he demanded an audience. He was known as a good listener, but also a great communicator. Now, that says something about language, that you can use it for good or for evil. And, and so we need to be careful of who we, who we listen to. Now, there are others that are missing, I know. People that would probably come up on the list would be Oprah. Uh, not so much for her communicative style or her ability as an orator, but just who she is, what she does. She demands an audience. And she speaks into people's lives, and people listen, and they respond. Um, another one, of course, good old Dr. Phil, you know. Uh, people want to hear what he has to say because they have a problem. And he speaks into their problem. He has answers, right? Another person uh, who's not known as a great communicator, but because of his office, he's heard. And uh, probably one of the most listened to people on the planet, Pope Francis. Uh, he's a wonderful man. He's speaking into people's lives all the time. And when he speaks, people listen. Now, the youngest generation, of course, one of my favorite you know, guys, Jimmy Fallon, is speaking into people's lives now, you know? All right. What he has to say doesn't mean anything, right? But, you know, it's just funny. All right. Now, okay. So, who's missing? Jesus. Yeah, amen, right? You know what? In Scripture, you have this verse. It's a very interesting verse. It says, John 7, 46, No one ever spoke the way this man does. Wow. This was actually a, a quote from a man that was sent. He was, was a Roman a soldier that was sent to capture Jesus and to bring him back. And he went to get Jesus. And when he was there, Jesus was teaching. And he was so mesmerized by his speech that he went back and said, Whoa, dude, I've never heard anybody like this. I mean, he just gripped this guy in such a way that he said, I haven't heard anybody ever speak this way. Well, why did Jesus demand such a hearing, such a following? We know that thousands and thousands of people followed Jesus. It was unprecedented in the day. And it would be even today to have people just, you know, trailing you, wanting to hear, hang on every word that you say. Well, I think one of the things that Jesus actually has in common with a lot of the people that I mentioned is that he spoke at the right time about the right thing. You know, um, all of these people were not necessarily trained speakers, but one thing that they did have in common is they spoke in a significant moment in history into people's lives. And they said things that needed to be heard at the moment. Romans 5 verse 6 says, At just the right time, when we were powerless... Christ died for the ungodly. That, that indicates that not only did he die at the right time, but he came at the right time. And that means that he also spoke into our lives at the right time. I've heard people say, well, how come Jesus didn't wait until like the internet was in, you know? And there were cell phones. He would have gotten a lot more press, right? If he would have been here when there was television and, you know, I said, you know what? He came at exactly the right moment in history and he spoke into history in such a way that right now our entire world revolves around this one man, Jesus. He may be a point of controversy. He may be a point where people are following, following but he is the point. He is the point. Now, there's another reason I think that Jesus is, is someone that people want to listen to. In Matthew 7, 28 and 29, uh, it says that the crowds were amazed at Jesus' teaching because he taught as one who had authority, not like the teachers of the law and the Pharisees of the time. What does that mean? It means that the people who were coming to listen to Jesus understood that Jesus didn't just blow smoke. All right? He wasn't just saying stuff and not delivering. He actually lived out what he said. When he said, forgive other people. He was the first guy on the line to forgive. Remember the woman who was caught in adultery? And he says, hey, pff, 
I don't condemn you. Jesus' own word says, I didn't come into this world to condemn the world. I, I didn't come to judge people. I came to set them free. Right? So the message that he was delivering was being lived out in his life, his everyday existence. And people got that. I mean, he didn't send people away hungry and said, hey, you know, be well, be good. He, he was there for the long haul. And ultimately, what we're going to celebrate today with communion represents the fact that he was willing to lay down his life for the people he came to save. It spoke volumes, right? And it wasn't like the people who were the other teachers who were just, Jesus said, you, you lay these heavy burdens on people. You make all these law, all these rules, all these regulations, and you don't lift a finger to help people out. You see, people got that. See, we know when someone is just, just talking to the wind and they, oh, they got good things to say and they might be animated, they might be funny, they may, might be speaking into your life, but they don't give a rip, right? Well, Jesus does. And people knew that. That gave him authority. Now, Jesus also had a, a, a stamp of approval that was beyond all others. You know, whenever I, I, you know, go someplace to hear somebody, I really like to have, you know, kind of a read on what was this person like. And so you, you, you kind of throw it out there and say, have you heard this person before? And depending upon what people say, tell you, and of course, you're, you're kind of judging this by their authority, right? So you say, well, you know, someone says, oh, they're great. And you're like, oh, yeah, right. You know, like... like uh, there's somebody in our family who will remain nameless that is, oh, you got to see this movie. And you're going like, considering the source, I don't want to see it, right? Okay. <laughs> it's like, nah, not going to go there because, you know, they warp, right? So you think, okay, you consider the source. Well, Jesus had uh, somebody's approval that was very important. Jesus actually went to a mountain. It's called the Mount of Transfiguration now. But he went there and, and he uh, took a, a, a two of his disciples with him, Peter and John, and Jesus was going there and he, he talked with Moses and Elijah, right? And this magical thing was happening. And it says, while, the, while they were still speaking, a bright cloud covered them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. This is God speaking into the moment. And he's not talking to Jesus. And he's not talking to Moses. He's not talking to Elijah. He's talking to who? The disciples. And they're going like, wow, what's going on here? And God speaks down from heaven, right? And he says, hey, dudes, this is my son. It's God in human form. And I sent him down to the planet. Listen to him, right? Now, the truth is that sometimes we listen to people, but we don't respond, right? Right? I mean, some, you, know, you know that, that it's true? And the statistics prove it out. They, you know, guys get a heart attack, right? They've been, you know, eating hamburgers and, and french fries and all this kind of stuff, and their arteries get all clogged up, and they've got to have, you know, a, you know, quintuple bypass surgery. 95% of all people who have this surgery to repair their body, right, because they're prone to, you know, cholesterol, high cholesterol and stuff, 95% never make a life change. In spite of the fact that their doctors tell them, you got to change your ways. I mean, they do it for maybe about a month or two months, and all of a sudden, I can smell the burgers in the grill, you know? <laughs> they don't change. I mean, how many, um, nobody here's ever done that, right? You know, you, no. you call somebody who's the expert, you ask for their advice, and they give it, and you go like, eh, I'm not going there, right? Right? Yeah, it's too hard. Okay? It's just too difficult. Or I, I'm going to go for a second opinion or a third opinion or a fourth opinion until I find somebody who agrees with me. <laughs> right? You see, we make ourselves out to be the expert when in reality, you know, God is saying, listen, people, I created you. I, I, I figured out how you're supposed to live in a peaceful, loving, coexistent way. And I, I send my son down to tell you how this is going to work. Listen to him. So Jesus has God's stamp of approval. You know? Now, there, there's another thing that's important to understand, and that is that Jesus is a teacher who wants you to understand what he has to say. Okay? He wants you to understand. Matter of fact, in Mark 7, 14, it, it says this. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, 
and understand this. Now, when I went to college, I had two different kinds of professors. One professor would, you know, be so easy to understand, make it very, you know, um, I mean, you could grab a hold of what they're saying, right? But there are these other professors. I had this one guy in an undergraduate class. It was a hist history class. At the beginning of the very first class, he said, no one in this class will get an A. Uh -huh. <laughs> wow. I'm going like... Okay, can you explain that, please? You know, because I'm kind of used to getting A's. And he says, you know, if I, if anyone in this class gets an A, then I've been too easy. Okay. Well, see, he bought into the Greek method of teaching. And the Greek method of teaching is simple. The teacher always knows more than the, than the students, and they will never know more than the students. And so the, the, the job of the teacher is to make the simple so complex that you go like... Dude, this guy's brilliant, because I don't understand a thing he's saying. How did we ever get to that point where we thought that not being able to understand someone makes them brilliant? Right? I think it makes them kind of goofy, right? All right? I mean, it's just the opposite. It's like you've got to take the complex and make it simple. That's what makes you a great communicator. Okay. Matter of fact, one of my favorite all-time guys, probably because I kind of look like the guy a little bit, you know, but <laughs> this is what I'm going to look like when I'm 90, all right? I'm, I'm shooting for it. I'm shooting for it, right? Okay. But he's, he said, I need more hair. I know, it's terrible. Okay. I'll get you later, all right? But I love this quote by Albert Einstein. He says, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Okay. Do you know that his book on the, on the, the theory of re relativity, okay, it's only 80 pages long. And, and the average high schooler can get it. They can understand it. it. It's pretty simple. He takes the complex and he breaks it down and he makes it easy to understand. Why? Because he wants you to know. You see, the job of the teacher isn't complete until the students understand what you're trying to communicate. This is why when Jesus told the disciples something and they were going like, I don't get it, right? He took them aside and he broke it down and he said, okay, this is what it means. I mean, if you go to the Gospels, every one of the parables are like that. They're going like, what are you talking in parables? I don't get it. And he says, sit down, let's, let's work it through. And then he lays it out until they go, oh, I get it. I can't. You see, Jesus doesn't want us to be clueless. He says, matter of fact, unless you become like a little child, you're not going to really enter into the kingdom of heaven in, in, a, in a real way. You, you've got to understand that this is easy to understand. It, it's not complex. And don't be thinking that just because somebody, they can, they can throw out the words and they sound brilliant because you don't understand what they're saying. Don't buy it. God wants you to get it. I mean, what don't you get about love God and love others? Right? I mean, it's like that little book. It was one of my favorite books. Everything I needed to know, I learned in kindergarten. Two principles. One, be nice. Two, don't hit anybody. You know? I mean, basically, he's taking exactly what God is saying and just put it into, you know, common vernacular. He's just saying, listen, people, just be nice and don't hit anybody. We would tell our kids that all the time. Right? Be nice to your sister and quit hitting her. You know? I mean, if they could just do that, it would be great. It would be great. This is exactly, this is why people flock to Jesus. He took what was told to them to be complex, and he broke it down. He said, listen, you know all of the laws, all of the prophets, all of that stuff that people pour over and pour over and pour over, and they stand outside the temples and they talk about it all day long in big glowing terms, and you think, oh, these people are so brilliant, I'm never going to know what they know. He says, it all boils down to this, people. Every single law, every single commandment that God ever gave is built on two stones. Love God and love each other. And if you do that, all the laws are going to be fulfilled. Every single one of them. And so, what's the Bible saying? It says, God chose the things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they're smart, think they're wise. Okay? A lot of people can spin, you know, a lot of theory, a lot of ideas, but at the end of the day, the simple wins the battle. 
And then I think the other thing that's huge is people listen to Jesus because they know that he cares for them. Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them. They follow me. Right? I mean, Jesus demands an audience because people know that he really does care. He knows everyone by name. He, he's there to embrace us. He's there to carry us through the hard times. You see, we have to remember that Jesus never asks us to go anywhere he hasn't already been. Okay? So he's experienced what it's like to be sick, to have maybe his father die, to be alienated from people, um, to be persecuted, to be talked badly about, to be beaten, maybe to be hungry, to be homeless. God gets that, right? Because he lived in Jesus' body. So Jesus cares for us. Now, this brings us to the next level, right? So... If, if Jesus is speaking, why aren't we listening? Right? Why aren't we listening? Now, um, the story of Martha and Mary, you know, it always pops up here, right? I mean, Martha and Jesus is at Martha's house, and Martha and Mary are there. Their sisters are doing the thing, and Martha is busy, you know, preparing the meal and all this kind of stuff. And, and, uh, and Mary is just kind of sitting there listening at Jesus' feet. And then Martha, she's kind of ticked. She says, listen! She says, listen! You know, she's distracted, it says, by all the, what? the preparations. The preparations can be roughly translated as all the things that she thinks is important. Right? Well, you've got to have the, the, you know, the right color plates for Jesus. And you've got to have matching napkins. Right? And they've got to be put just so. Right? And, and then, you, you know, you've got to clean this and you've got to have flowers over here. And, blah, 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 and, you know? and, and, and then she's so upset. What does she say? She says, Jesus, tell her to help me. One of the things that we do is we get our own ideas about what's important. Yeah. Right? Jesus says, these are the important things in life. And then we say, no, 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 these are the important things in life. I've got to do these things. And then, if other people aren't buying in, what do we do? I don't know if anybody else does this, right? But we are invested in certain things, and in order to validate our idea about this, we try to get everybody else to do what we do. We've got to get them to believe the things we believe and, and invest themselves in the same things that we do. Okay? I mean, she says, it's important to have a clean house, right? We've got to have this all spiffed up and all that. You know, now, some people, you know, take this patches and, and they, they use this to validate the fact that you don't have to clean your house, right? I mean, you don't have to worry about housework. As long as you have a little bit to eat, you're okay, right? That's not the point. The point is that we can get distracted from hearing God's voice when we are about the things that we think are important. And then we try to convince other people these are important for them too. It kind of validates us and our ideas about what we're doing. Okay? So Jesus says, hey, you know, she's chosen the more important thing, and that is listen to God. Okay? Now, um, are we listening? Are we, or are we distracted? Now, I, I know that you know, I have this problem. I don't know if anybody else has this problem. I have a lovely wife who's brilliant. She speaks into my life very often. And sometimes, you know, she'll tell me something. And I'll even shake my head and nod. And I'll even verbally respond to her that I heard her. Right? And then I totally forget to do what she asked me to do. Isn't that right, honey? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, she's, she's hearing me. She's nodding. Yes, okay. Uh, I got, she's validating the, the truth that I am a schlub. Okay? <laughs> I don't know why. I love her to death. I don't know why I do that. I'll tell you why. I get distracted. I get other stuff I'm thinking about. My, my mind's cluttered with other things. But I can, I can hear her. I can, I can understand what she's saying. And I can even respond verbally that I will do what she told me to do. And then I'll just forget. Okay? Sometimes I go like, when did I do that? You know, I didn't hear that, right? Um, we do that with Jesus, right? We hear, and we even understand, and we, oh, I'm going to do that. I validate that in my life. And then we don't, right? Well, Jesus says this, okay? Luke 8, 15 and 18. Uh, it says, don't be distracted, right? I mean, oh, I forgot that, you know, distractions, all right? Nobody ever does that during church, right? Okay, okay. <laughs> Got to see that one, all right? Yeah, okay. Oh, really, I'm taking notes, okay? Okay. Um, oops, boy, I didn't get going. There we go, okay. Uh, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. I wanted a set of these for my son when he was little, all right? Uh, 
And then Jesus says this, he says, consider carefully how you listen. So it's not enough just to hear the words. We have to consider it. We have to sit down, we have to make space and time to really listen. Consider carefully how we're listening, okay? And then it, the question comes up, so how are we, we responding? Once we finally get the idea that God is trying to impress on us, what do we do with it? You know, James 1, and 25 says this. It says, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. If you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, then God will what? Bless you. He'll bless you. God never asks us to do anything or to be anything that's not good for us. Now, I'm not saying that it's easy. Okay? What's good for you isn't always the easiest thing. Sometimes it's the hardest thing to do. But it's the best thing for you to do. And so, to make space, to take time to hear what God has to say, and understand that looking carefully doesn't mean that it's hard to understand. It means take a careful look and be honest with yourself. Be honest about what you're hearing, and honestly try, uh, through asking God's Spirit, to en enliven that in your life, to get it done, whatever He's asking you to do.